Hello, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Roy Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. Even before annual ESMO 2023 meeting started, there was a lot of buzz around practice changing studies coming along in GU oncology, particularly with bladder cancer. There was a lot of data presented, but only one got standing ovation as it doubled the overall survival benefit. Today, we'll focus on three key studies from ESMO 2023. And to go over this important data, we'd like to welcome Dr. Raina McKay from UCS State. In our discussion, we'll start off with Sunrise 1 in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, then focus on EV302 for metastatic bladder cancer, and then close with PSMA4 in prostate cancer. Reyna, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Reyna, welcome. To start, we picked out Sunrise 1, a phase 2b study, because most of the patients with bladder cancer diagnosis present with non-muscle invasive disease, out of which 40 to 50% can in fact be BCG unresponsive. We have started seeing more and more of these patients in our practice as medical oncologists post-approval of pembrolizumab in this space. Here in this study, we looked at two different agents, TAR200, which is an intravesical delivery system giving chemotherapy locally versus citrolimab, a PD-1 antibody. And complete responses with single agent TAR-200 are very impressive. Your thoughts here? No, I mean, I think this is an unmet need in bladder cancer. Um, for patients that have BCG refractory non-muscle invasive disease, Right now, the standard of care is largely moving forward with radical cystectomy in these individuals. And so, you know, developing treatment options that can help uh, control the disease, prevent development of muscle invasiveness, it's really critical. So I think these data are very, um, you know, uh, we certainly welcome uh, such uh, high response rates in this setting. I think, um, you know, uh, you know, hopefully this is going to be something that's going to translate into, you know, uh, clinically meaningful uh, delays of uh, radical cystectomy and and not, you know, compromising oncologic outcomes. You know, I think looking at the centrally assessed and investigator assessed, um, you know, CR rates, particularly in individuals who have BCG refractory CIS, I mean, that's a very high risk population for developing muscle invasive disease, you know, greater than 75%, um, you know, that's that's excellent. You know, their, their numbers are, are small, um, but I think this is definitely um, signal finding um, and warrants further investigation in a, in a larger study. Great, now thank you for going over that. You brought up radical cystectomy. There was actually a clinical study that looked at patient's preference being, what are your options, radical cystectomy versus any experimental arm? And close to 90% of the patients said, I would rather choose an experimental arm. And again, the point being here is that the quality of life data and patient preferences to preserve that bladder. And these results are very exciting because if not, then our option, like Roy mentioned, immunotherapy, which has also not been a home run by any means. Yeah, no, completely, right. completely agree. So moving right along in metastatic bladder cancer, the current standard of care in first line settings has been chemotherapy followed by maintenance immunotherapy. Earlier this year, enfortumab with Pembro was approved based on phase two study for cis ineligible patients. This brings us to EV302, a phase three study looking at enfortumab with Pembro in cis eligible and cis ineligible settings versus standard of care chemotherapy arm. The primary endpoint here was PFS and OS. Reina, what did the study show? This was a landmark study. I mean, slam you you wait 30 years to see a study like this. I mean, it was spectacular to see for our patients who have metastatic bladder cancer looking at overall survival that's um, approaching three years for this population. I mean, it is unheard of. Um, what systemic therapy option in the metastatic setting is associated with complete responses close to 30%? I mean, it was just astounding. I mean, um, being at ESMO, being in the room, honestly, as soon as the OS curves um, were displayed on the screen, there was a a standing ovation in the room because it was really a home run for patients. We actually witnessed the standard of care changing right there, right before our eyes. I think no longer is it ethical to give 
any platinum based chemotherapy for frontline bladder. And, um, you know, I think it, I think this is a, this is a win for patients. I think, um, thinking about reducing this to practice, a lot of questions are, how can I use this sooner? How can I use it earlier? We saw data presented from uh, uh, EV301 looking at neoadjuvant utilization of this regimen and, um, you know, even thinking about um, utilization across other tumor types that have high nectin expression, I think is, I mean, this was a slam dunk. It truly was, and I feel like now slam dunk home run boards don't even do justice looking at these overall survival curves. Now, also, we saw the data on Checkmate 901 with cisplatin, gemcitabine, nivolumab. Uh, that combination data also has overall survival benefit. But here in U.S., with U EV and Pembro being our new standard of care, any clinical pearls, particularly for infortumab in this setting? You know, I think um, just to step back and think, I think one of the um, issues with this study was um, thinking about uh, post-EV uh, or utilization of immunotherapy in the maintenance setting in the control arm, but actually about 30% of patients received maintenance uh, checkpoint inhibition. So I think it does reflect a real world patient population. I think EV is a very um, interesting agent that does require a specific uh, uh, you know, focus on side effects. Um, there can be some distinct side effects associated with EV as um, individuals start using this agent in practice, given in the U.S. it's actually already FDA approved. Um, things to watch out for include the dermatitis, the rash, the hyperglycemia, the peripheral neuropathy. Um, so I do think that there's going to be a learning curve with utilization um, and ensuring that patients have appropriate supportive care. Um, there's appropriate dose modification as needed to ensure that patients can really, um, you know, maximize the benefit of this treatment. Absolutely. This indeed is going to be our new standard of care. However, this poses some unique problems. What to do in second line? As we do not have much data for chemo or even erdafitinib after progression on IO and antibody drug conjugates, Reina, what are you going to be doing in your practice? So very interestingly, in the in the treatment arm, about a quarter of patients went on to receive platinum-based chemotherapy. And so I do think um, subset analyses from this study, looking at the types of therapy that people received is going to be critically important. I don't think that um, this study results in uh, removal of platinum from the treatment landscape for, for bladder cancer. Platinums are, are clearly very effective. And my suspicion is that that, that may evolve into a um, second or third line setting to patient on the depending on the patient profile. Um, but uh, you know, the EV arm, like I said, a quarter of patients did receive second line uh, or later line of platinum. Thanks for that. Now moving right along, taking the limelight away from bladder cancer for the next few minutes. Let us focus on PSMA4 study in prostate cancer. In this study, lutetium plavecto was looked at mainly for metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer patient population after they have progressed on first line androgen receptor pathway inhibitors and patients were rather chemo naive in this setting. Reina, your thoughts on the study design and its findings. So this was a very important study building off of the early data from the vision trial. The vision trial led to the introduction of lutetium PSMA into clinical practice. That study was designed specifically for patients having received a prior taxing and having progressed um, on an ARSI and patients were randomized to receive lutetium plus standard of care versus standard of care alone. And so um, at the pr prior to these, these data, we were largely utilizing uh, uh, you know, lutetium in the post-taxane, post-ARSI setting. So this trial actually demonstrated that there is efficacy of lutetium both pre- and post-chemotherapy. Um, this trial doesn't really answer the question of what's the most appropriate sequence, um, uh, but it does provide uh, efficacy data on the utilization prior to chemo. Um, the study was designed um, with crossover allowed in the ARPI um, control arm, and 80% of patients approximately went on to receive um, lutetium in the control arm, which is obviously going to affect that overall survival signal. Um, but we saw pretty dramatic um, response rates uh, with prolonged PFS um, with this agent in the pre-chemotherapy um, setting. So I think, um, 
you know, the hope is that uh, potentially the label for this agent could be expanded to especially include patients that have not received prior chemotherapy, really to give patients more options um, as you're sequencing therapies in the MCRPC setting. Absolutely. This, of course, is a very active agent. I think that the bigger thing is accessibility. We really hope that this is going to be more accessible to more and more um, institutions for us to use this. Raina, in your day-to-day practice, are you now using PSMA PET scan for all your patients to be staged over other imaging modalities? So very good question. I think in the context of MCRPC, um, the utility of uh, PSMA PET is largely for eligibility for radio ligand therapy or potentially clinical trials. It is not for assessing um, disease progression or disease response, those criteria to define progression and response with PSMA PET have just really not been defined. We don't really know what an increased SUV means in an existing lesion. Is that progression? We don't know. Um, It's certainly being utilized uh, for those patients that have a newly diagnosed um, disease, um, particularly those individuals with high-risk localized to assess for occult metastases. It's also being utilized in the uh, biochemically recurrent setting to assess for, um, you know, oligometastatic disease. Um, I would warn against use of uh, PET imaging for volume assessment of disease in the MHSPC setting. You know, these criteria for high and low volume have been largely defined based off of conventional imaging and not uh, PSMA PET imaging. Absolutely. Those are such great points. Thank you so much, Raina, for going over these practice changing studies with us today. Post ESMO 2023, we certainly have new standard of care treatment for bladder cancer, while the rest of the data is still evolving. To those who are listening, stay with us for a short summary. As community oncologists, it is exciting times to see so much happening all around us. In this segment, we have covered three important studies in GU oncology space post ESMO 2023 with Dr. Raina McKay. Sunrise 1 for TAR 200. With such promising results and complete responses, this will hopefully fill a big unmet need, particularly in BCG unresponsive non muscle invasive bladder cancer patient population. Post ESMO 2023 and Fortimab Vidotin with Pembrolizumab should be our new standard of care in first line metastatic bladder cancer as it has doubled the overall survival benefit in this patient population. Lastly, we covered PSMA-4 study and the significant improvement in PFS with lutetium PSMA in metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer patients. Make sure to check out our highlights on breast cancer, GI malignancies, and lung cancer post-ESMO 2023. And we are the Oncology Brothers.